Seated. Good morning. Good morning. I feel like I spent the night here. <laughs> I've been here, I was here for the first, I don't, first service, I guess, and then for um, a talk and now again. So I don't know how priests do it, three, two sermons and things in between, but it's good to be here especially to help you in commemorating the 400 years of the anniversary of the 400 years of the beginning of slavery in this country. So in 1619 in August, a, a slave ship, a ship came into Fort Point Comfort, Virginia and sold 20 people from Angola in exchange for supplies. 20 East Africans and, well, I think maybe Southern Africans, actually, and um, started the system that has given birth to so many of the troubles that we have in this country. But one thing that you should know is that there were two people named Isabella and um, Anthony who were allowed to get married and they had a baby that they named William. And in 1624, William was baptized in the Anglican Church and was the first black person to be baptized in our church, even though he was a slave. I think that's an important piece of information for us to hold on to. So when we started this system, this system of exchanging human beings in, to get labor, to have labor, buying and selling, we started a system that has now given us many things that we have to work very hard to overcome. And it was 400 years ago, but in many ways, that system didn't really go away. It has just evolved. It evolved into mass incarceration. It has evolved into the ways in which we uh, meet out the death penalty. It has evolved into lynching, and it has evolved into having structural racism in our country that we have to keep working at. One of the things that I always want to make really clear when I'm talking about this is that oppression is an energy system. It's really important to think about this this way because we tend to think that oppression in one part of the earth or on one part of the earth is way different from oppression somewhere else. But actually, oppression is an energy system and it is the same everywhere. And no matter what you are trying to oppress somebody for, whether it's race or gender or physical ability, or class, it's the same system. It's a system of believing that somebody is better than somebody else, and anything that you choose to do to them is okay. When I worked with people in Honduras working on racial healing and dismantling racism, I was amazed to hear the same kinds of stories that I've heard in the United States in doing this work. So it became really affirmed for me that there is just something insidious about this that's, that's the same, the same kind of spirit. And it really makes it important to understand as we try to work against this energy, it is important to understand what we are working against. A few minutes ago in the, the session that I was just doing on resilience, we talked about how important it is to interrupt that energy. So every time you stand against that oppressive energy, every time you resist it, you interrupt it. And it makes you a resistor. So people are in this country, we in this room are either doing one or two things. We're either resisting it or else we're in, we're in compliance with it. We're either complicit or else we are resisting. And the ways in which we resist don't have to be monumental. 
the ways in which we resist really need to be reflected in just understanding what's going on and standing against it, speaking against it, being against it, and knowing that it is an indefensible thing, this energy of oppression. I think that these words from Isaiah really speak to us in the state that we find ourselves here in the 21st century. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. We still have too many oppressive structures. I want you to think about, because oppression is an energy system, it was that energy that made it possible to sell little black babies out of the arms of their mothers for the high, to the highest bidder. It was that same energy that made it possible to take little native indigenous children and put them into schools. And by the way, some of those schools our Episcopal communion owned and fostered, to put them in those schools and beat them if they didn't speak English, to learn English so they would be more acceptable. It's that same energy that is fostering the ability to take little brown children from their parents now. It doesn't change. And so when we say, oh, that's not how we are, it is how we are. It is how we are. Because it's energy that we, have, we keep allowing to assert itself. We keep allowing it to have a voice. And our commitment, particularly as people of faith, is to be about interrupting it. Interrupting it. Ultimately, if we interrupt it enough, hope we, hopefully we will destabilize it so that someday it won't have enough oof to do anything. That's my notion. One of the things that I want to make really clear is that I think in order for us to do anything about changing the systems and structures that have grown out of that first slave sale, is we have to make up our minds if we want to imagine the world in a different way. We have to ask ourselves, do we really want to be well? You know, I love that, that, that uh, story of the, the man at the pool of Bethesda and when he um, complained to Jesus about nobody helping him to get in the pool when the angels came to trouble the water and Jesus didn't join him in the lament. Jesus just said to him, do you want to be well? Do you want to be healed? So I think if I ask that myself that question about our country, do you want to be healed? I don't think I can say yes because I'm not sure for the whole country, but I'm absolutely sure that people of faith have got to say, yes, we want to be well. And if we want to be well, then we have to be willing to open ourselves to the possibility of hearing God's voice in ways that we've never heard before. You know, I, I am sitting here speaking, not because I'm trying to act like Jesus. Jesus sat to preach all of the time. And it puts me in good company because whatever Jesus did, I would like to do. I'm sitting here because I have rheumatoid arthritis and it's easier for me to speak from a seat than standing. But let me tell you something about rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic illness. It has to be managed. I don't get to pretend that I don't have it. I don't get to act like tomorrow I can just go running or that I can eat everything I want to eat or not take my medicine. I don't get to do that. It's a chronic illness and it has to be managed. Racism is a chronic illness that plagues us and we have to work at it. We cannot 
act as if because we did one thing today, we're done. It has to be managed. It has to be worked with day after day. We have to resist, and we have to do it over and over. So uh, many, many times I have heard black and white people say, I'm just so tired of this, can't we stop talking about it? Can't we just act like everything's as good as we think it is? Well, the truth of the matter is, we can't. Because it's a chronic illness. And as soon as you take your eye off of it, as soon as you decide that you're done, then it gets to go do stuff that can surprise you. So every day, we have to be vigilant. And we have to be vigilant until we die. That's how long. You know, we don't get done. We don't get done because we did this wonderful set of events here or there or yonder. We don't get done because we celebrated Black History Month. We just have to keep doing everything. I have been doing this work since I was in college. I am now 73 years old, so that's about 50 years. 50 years and there's more to do today than there was when I started. And that's all right, because what God requires is that I will stay faithful, the same as God requires of you, that we stay faithful, that we understand that oppression is insidious, that racism is a chronic illness, and that we have to resist it. And the good news is that God will be there. The good news. You know, if I didn't think God was going to be there, I think I might just have to go see if I could disintegrate. I would be done. But knowing that God is going to meet us on the path, that we can imagine ourselves as whole people, we can be well, we can say yes, we want to be well. And we can be ready to not have anybody oppressed in our midst. We can make sure that people have food and shelter. We can make sure that racism doesn't continue to destabilize us and make us have some people with a whole lot and some people with not enough, because racism plays into that. The only thing that I'm interested in is healing. I don't think that it's important to do, to, you know, it doesn't help to try to make people do anything because you can barely make yourself do something. So you really do have to just try to be as well as you can and then to share with folks that you have found out that there really is a bandage closet and that the wounded can go there. We are all wounded. We have all been wounded by that system that got put into place when we started selling human beings in order to accomplish the stuff we wanted to accomplish. All of us are wounded. All of us can answer whether we want to be well or not. A lot of times people like to tell me that when we're talking to folks that are willing to listen about race, that we're talking to the choir. My response to that is, there is no choir. We're all in this together. We're all in it together. And because we are people of faith, we have a reason to stay together. You know, you've got some folks in your family that you might be happy if they moved on to Mars. A few of them, if they just left. And if they're not in your family, they may be in your circle. But because you care about them, you keep on hanging in there with them. So that's what we do as people of faith. We don't give up on each other. We, you know, we might make each other a little bit upset. We might decide that we would like to take a break from one another, but we don't give up because God never gives up on us, ever. So I can tell the truth about my country and be glad that I'm here. 
I've been in a few places other than this country, and I'm glad to be here. But the truth is still needing to be told. And we, we have this thing in the church that says, the truth will set you free. But you know, we say a lot of stuff that we don't quite want to live into, and the truth will set you free. You might be kind of feeling like you've been beat up a little bit before you get there, but it will set you free. So at the Center for Racial Healing, which I have the great and distinct pleasure of directing, we say that we have created a brave space where the truth can be told. And we will tell the truth with compassion and care because everybody who walks through the door is a precious child of God. But we will tell the truth and we won't try to change it so that somebody can feel safe. I think we need to remove that safe space language from our vocabulary and talk about creating spaces where we're willing to tell the truth because the church ought to be a place where the truth can be told. And we hope that in the process of doing that, we open up space so that God's transformative energy can come into the space and there's a chance that beloved community can be created. We say a lot of things. We talk about racial reconciliation. We talk about beloved community. But the real truth is, until we do the healing work, we're not going to have any reconciliation, and we're not going to have any beloved community. Until we deal with the wounds that have been inflicted upon us because we live in the culture where we set up a, a, a process to make some people superior and other people inferior. We've got to deal with that woundedness. And there are plenty bandage closets. And Jesus is so glad to show us the way. So I, I want to invite you to come to the Center for Racial Healing to visit us. We have a marker there to remember the over 600 people who were lynched in Georgia because lynching is one of those things that we have to tell the truth about. And we would love for you to come and visit us. We would love for you to figure out ways to partner with us because we know that this work has got to be done in partnership with everybody who's trying to be liberated and everybody who's trying to be well. So I think these words from Isaiah today though they were written all those years ago, are exactly the words that we need to be hearing right this minute. And I have to tell you the truth, I was so glad to see them because the gospel just wasn't working for what I needed to say about the 400 years. So, and I thought, I've, I think I can talk about the Old Testament lesson, and George said, yes, I could. So. Um, because it so speaks to us and tells us the formula, the formula for getting well is to open our hearts, open our heads, and to allow the light to come so that we can have the courage and the stamina to be resistors. And so that we can show the world that there is a light that can shine in the darkness, this darkness that we have right now in the 21st century in our land. We can be the light to shine in that darkness. And we can say to people, there is a reason to have hope because we know the person, the spirit that stands for hope and healing and light. I just pray to God that we will all come to make courage normal in our lives and not extraordinary, that we will be so courageous that we'll shock ourselves. I pray that for you and for me, and that we will interrupt negativity and that we will allow God to transform us into the people that God intends for us to be. May the good Lord bless you 
and keep you and give you extraordinary courage an extraordinary stamina and an extraordinary intention to turn your face toward healing. Amen.